Well, the book of Esther. I've been excited about this. This is a, well, I guess I have a lot of favorite stories and books in the Bible, but this one is right up there. This is found in the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, Christians often call it, the book of Esther. And it is the story of a woman named Esther. I met an Esther at the first service. I wonder, if there, are there any Esthers here? Anybody guys Esther, first name, middle name? Well, maybe it'll come back. Uh, I think it's a beautiful name because it's a beautiful story. A little bit of background. Uh, this story comes to us, this is uh, about 500 BCE, or 500 years before Christ. The nation of Israel, about uh, 727 BCE, 227 years earlier than this, had been carried into exile by the Babylonians. Well, the Babylonians were defeated by the Persians, and King Cyrus, about 100 years before this, the king of, the, the, of Persia and the Medes, he decided that any Jews who wanted to could go back to their homeland. And many of them chose to do that, but not all. Some of them had settled and were quite content to be there in, in Persia. So we pick up the story now. Uh, this takes place in the city of Susa, which uh, you can see uh, on the map there you have Iran is a uh, modern day name for Persia. And highlighted there is the city of Susa, which uh, is now Shush, Iran. So now you know this is about where we are uh, geographically and in time. Let's listen now to the story. Now I could tell you the story, but I couldn't tell it to you any better than the author. This is so well written, uh, and it's a wonderful plot. We're going to discover it today and in the weeks ahead. It's just got every element of, of something that could be on a miniseries on television. It could be a movie. In fact, it's been uh, made into both those things. But here now, the word as it comes to us from Esther. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. Now, I should say... Often I'll read from the New Revised Standard Version. This is the New International Version. And one of the reasons I chose it is because in the NRSV, the king's name is difficult for me to say. <laughs> I have to think about it every time. It's a, a hasherus. And to me, the only way I can say it well, quickly, without thinking, is to sneeze it. A hasherus. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that, you know. Uh, so this says Xerxes. It renders it Xerxes. It's just much easier for me. So this is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces stretching from India to Kush. At that time, King Xerxes reigned from his royal throne in the citadel of Susa. And in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. The military leaders of Persia and Media, the princes and the nobles of the provinces were present. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet lasting seven days. Imagine a party that went on for seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. The gardens had hangings of white and blue linen fastened with cords of white linen and purple material to silver rings on marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and other costly stones. Wine was served in goblets of gold, each one different from the other. And the royal wine was abundant in keeping with the king's liberality. By the king's command, each guest was allowed to drink in his own way, but the king instructed all the wine stewards to serve each man what he wished. Queen Vashti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. On the seventh day, when King Xerxes was in high spirits with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mahuman, Bizda, Arpona, Bigtha, Abagatha, Zethar, and Karkas, to bring before him Queen Vashti, wearing her royal crown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Ooh, not good. 
But if I could just put myself in Queen Vansky's place, think about it. These guys have been drinking for seven days, you know, and, and I just see the king, maybe a little tipsy at this point, because he's also, hey, let's bring out my beautiful wife, the queen. And, you know, they're all going to leer at her. Doesn't say why she wouldn't come, but that might be a reason. Uh, anyway, for whatever reason, she refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Suffice it to say, this king has issues. But we'll move on. We'll move on. We're going to skip a few verses uh, up now to verse 15. Uh, according to law, because now he's, he's called his uh, legal experts together and says to them, according to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? He asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Xerxes that the eunuchs have taken to her. Then the Mucan replied in the presence of the king and the nobles, Queen Vashti has done wrong, not only against the king, but against all the nobles and the people of all the provinces of King Xerxes. For the queen's conduct will become known to all the women, and so they will despise their husbands and say, King Xerxes commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, but she didn't come. This very day, the Persian and Median women of the nobility who have heard about the queen's conduct will respond to all the king's nobles in the same way. There will be no end to disrespect and discord. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. Then when the king's edict is proclaimed throughout all his vast realm, all the women will respect their husbands from the least to the greatest. The king and his nobles were pleased with this advice, so the king did as Mamukin proposed. He sent dispatches to all parts of the kingdom, to each province in its own script, and to each people in its own language, proclaiming in each people's tongue that every man should be ruler over his own household. A recipe for marital harmony, not. <laughs> But this is how it, this is, the Bible's just telling us how it is, you know, what happened, what is, not a prescription, okay? Uh, so, now, we got a guy to find a new queen, right? Vashti, out of the picture, never to appear before the king again. Uh, we're going to get a new queen. So, uh, they sent out for resumes, and no, no, that's not how they did it. There's going to be a contest, something of a, uh, maybe a beauty pageant, or... Uh, are you familiar with this? America's Got Talent? <laughs> you ever seen this? This is the kind of show where people uh, who are not stars, they come and, like Sophia, she could be on this show who sang for us. It was beautiful. Uh, you know, and then there's four judges, right? And they're, they say whether or not you advance to the next round. Well, in today's game show, Persia's Got Talent. There's not four judges, there's only one. And his name is King Xerxes. Oh, oh, I'm ahead of myself. Yes, this is the beauty, this is, there's gonna be a, uh, everybody's gonna have beauty treatments, you see. This is part of the deal, so, all right, enough of her. Uh, let me go on. Verse five, there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon among those taken captive with Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Mordecai is a key player in the story. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This girl, who was also known as Esther, was lovely in form and features, and Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. When the king's order and edict had proclaimed, many girls were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Haggai. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Haggai, who had charge of the harem. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Now this is the first person besides Mordecai that we hear Esther having contact with, and he impresses this man uh, who's in charge of uh, all the women there. The girl pleased him and won his favor. Immediately, Hegai provided her with beauty treatments, 
This is the cucumbers and the eyes, okay? Uh, and special food. He assigned her to seven maids selected from the king's palace and moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. So already, she's won the favor of this key player in the court, he guy. Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background. Remember, she's Jewish. Because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the courtyard of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. Now, now we get to Persia's Got Talent. And the one ruler, the one judge in this uh, is who? King Xerxes. And we have a picture of him here. Uh, not four judges, but one. Uh, who knew that he bared this remarkable resemblance to Howie Mandel? Uh, King Xerxes. There he is. All right. Now, we're going to zip ahead to verse 15. When the term came for Esther, the girl Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle Abihail, to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what a guy, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. So she is following this good advice of the king's number one man there over the harem. And Esther won the favor of everyone who saw her. She was taken to King Xerxes in the royal residence in the 10th month, the month of Tebeth, in the seventh year of his reign. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. And the king gave a great banquet, Esther's banquet, for all of his nobles and officials. He proclaimed a holiday throughout the provinces and distributed gifts with royal liberality. Esther has won the contest, and she has been made queen, Queen Esther. Now, I couldn't find a good photograph of Queen Esther, but I, I love this mosaic. This is found in the Dormition Church of, uh, in Jerusalem on Mount Zion. And I think it just, to me, it just captures something of the simple beauty and elegance of this young woman, Esther. Now, the plot here takes a little side trip. Listen to what happens next. I'm at verse 19 of chapter 2. When the virgins were assembled a second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. But Esther had kept secret her family background and nationality, just as Mordecai had told her to do. For she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions, as she had done when he was bringing her up. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were hanged on a gallows. All this was reported in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. Very important detail that this was written down uh, in the king's presence in this book of the annals. We're going to need this in a future week in this series. All right. You got that? Mordecai's good deed recorded. Now, as we move to chapter 3, we've met three of the four main characters. We have met uh, the king, King Xerxes. We, yeah, <laughs> Howie Mandel's uh, ancestor. Uh, we have met Mordecai, and we have met Esther. And now we are about to meet the fourth who plays the villain in this narrative, Haman. Haman. After these events, Esther chapter 3, after these events, King Xerxes honored Haman's son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gate knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. Then the royal officials at the king's gate asked Mordecai, why do you disobey the king's command? Day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior would be tolerated. 
for Mordecai had told them he was a Jew. Or maybe it was Haman who told them he was a Jew. Anyway, this is the problem. This is the problem. Mordecai is Jewish. Haman is an Agagite. Bit of history here. King Agag, and you can read about this in the Bible, Exodus, Numbers, and 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 15. Uh, it, Agag was a uh, king over the Amalekites. And at one point in Israel's history, they were, and this was 1 Samuel 15, uh, they were to wipe out, at God's word, the Amalekites, which would be King Agag and, and everybody that he ruled. Well, this is a problem for Haman, who knows that Mordecai is Jewish, the same Mordecai that is not willing to bend the knee and pay him homage, just like King Xerxes has said to do. Uh, I, uh, this is a, it's not really spelled out, but boy, it's a, it's a key understanding. Uh, in fact, if you read the narrative uh, in 1 Samuel 15, it's uh, Samuel who kills King Agag. Uh, with a sword. Saul wouldn't do it. Saul's in trouble because of this. And uh, Samuel says, give me the sword. I'm just <laughs> off of it. Um, you know, usually when we think of a prophet like Samuel, we're thinking somebody who foretells, you know, but apparently the no stranger to the sword necessarily. So if your pastor has a prophetic edge, <laughs> look out. Yeah, but, you know, we really don't know why Mordecai wouldn't bow. Uh, Maybe it was because of this, uh, him being an Agagite. Uh, there was no prohibition for Jews to honor secular leaders. Uh, there was nothing that said they couldn't bow down. Some, some scholars think that perhaps Haman was wearing an idol uh, on his uh, tunic. And of course, no observant Jew would bow down to an idol, uh, just like no observant Christian would bow down to an idol. So you know, maybe that was it. Uh, like I said, we don't know. We don't know. It could have been the Agagite thing. It could have been he just thought Haman was a jerk. We'll have, to, we'll have to leave that to speculation. But we do know this. Verse 5. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. Wow. He's not just satisfied with, with taking out Mordecai. He, he, he wants the whole Jewish people to be annihilated. In the twelfth month of King Xerxes, in the first twelfth year, rather, in the first month, the month of Nisan, they cast the pur, that is, the lot, in the presence of Haman, to select a day and month. And the lot fell in the twelfth month, the month of Adar. Then Haman said to King Xerxes, There is a certain people, dispersed and scattered among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom, who keep themselves separate. Their customs are different from those of all other people, and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest 